We'll be hearing a great deal from Jack King, of course, as the morning goes on. You got a good view there from one of the 60 fixed cameras around the uh, launch uh, site by which uh, the National Space people there in launch control monitor every one of the functions, the critical functions of the uh, launch. With me here at our CBS News uh, Space Center here at Merritt Island, overlooking the launch site out there, is one of the most distinguished uh, of the science fiction writers, people who uh, have predicted long before uh, the scientists were ready to, uh, to put down the final plan just how we would go to the moon. And this is Arthur C. Clarke, who among his other distinguished bits of uh, science fiction includes uh, 2001, the, uh, the great movie which uh, recently came out. Incidentally, Arthur, I just read that they showed it uh, uh, with great success in Moscow last night yeah. uh, at a film festival. Apparently got great plaudits there, as it has everywhere around the world. Arthur, uh, you first wrote of uh, going to the moon back in 1930s, and uh, at a time when nobody really dreamed it would come this soon. I don't think even you did, did you? No, I didn't imagine it would be in my lifetime in those days. And how do you feel this morning here at the Cape? Well, of course, very excited, and yet I have a sort of... Well, this is where I came in feeling at the same time. I'm excited, yet um, it's familiar. There's a feeling of familiarity about all this, and now, of course, I'm thinking about the next thing, Mars and beyond. You're already thinking of Mars and beyond. We haven't gotten to the moon yet, Arthur. <laughs> well, that's the nature of you science uh, fiction writers, I suppose. Uh, did, does, does this about uh, match what you, the way you thought we would do it? As far as the technical details are concerned, yes. This is precisely the way it was imagined. But what we never imagined was the scale, and I might say that the cost and complexity of the enterprise. In fact, if we'd realized just how difficult and complex it would be, we'd probably been pretty discouraged back in the 30s. We thought we could build a spaceship for a few million dollars. Well, it's cost a few million just to launch it. Of course, there's been a little bit of inflation since then, but uh, I think that the figure they give now for just the launch cost alone is $69 million. That's no equipment, that's just launching. Mm -hmm. But all this money is going to come back many times over in the generations to come. This is probably the best investment the United States has ever made. And in another 10 years, another 20 years, people will be unable to imagine why we ever question this expenditure. How do you see it coming back? Through the space industries of the next generation, industry as well as in commerce are going to move out into space probably before the end of this century. There are many things we'll find we could only do in space. Thus we found there are many things on this earth we could only do with, with airplanes and helicopters, you know, which at one time seemed to be of no practical importance. This is going to happen in space. Arthur, would you expect that they'll find any surprises out there? Oh, I'm sure they will. Nature is always more complex and more interesting than we can ever anticipate. And uh, we're going to find some surprises on the moon, not necessarily on this first flight, but I'm sure eventually. I don't know whether we're going to find a large black monolith waiting for us on the moon, though. <laughs> <laughs> a reference to 2001. Would you like to tell me what that's all about? No, we won't. Yeah, I don't that. think we have time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of us who have seen 2001, there's a, there's a lot of mystery about, the, about that uh, far out uh, closing. Uh, for the picture, uh, which we all liked, but uh, which we still argue in our family about, about just what it all means. Maybe before this whole thing is over, Arthur, because I expect to have you sitting beside me many times in the next eight days of the flight of Apollo 11, as we were so delighted to have you in previous flights. Uh, you'll tell me the real secret of the monolith. Okay, that's a promise. Right. Hey, hey, I think I've got something there. All right, hold on, Arthur. We're going to have many more talks about the moon, how we get there, and the future, and uh, your ideas of how we're going to get on even beyond the moon. Jack King and Launch Control now. Aldrin have armed their rotational hand controllers, the controllers they use in flight, and we have now gone to the automatic system with the emergency detection system, that system that would uh, cue the astronauts uh, if there's trouble down below with the Saturn V rocket during the powered flight. We're now coming up on the 10 minute mark, 10 minutes away from our planned liftoff. Mark, T minus 10 minutes and counting, T minus 10. We're aiming for our planned liftoff at 32 minutes past the hour. This is Kennedy Launch Control. And uh, let us uh, tell you now some of the things you're going to be seeing here because there is no time in the excitement and in the reports of the launch itself. And indeed, you can scarcely be heard 
over the great roar of the great uh, Saturn V engine, the most powerful engine as far as we know that is a series of engines that have ever been used to get man uh, off the surface or to move him anywhere on the surface of the Earth for that matter. The Russians, uh, we believe, are developing a rocket larger than this, but we have no evidence that they have used it as yet. Well, now, about uh, 40 seconds before launch, uh, the water deluge begins. You'll see some, uh, some evidence of it, perhaps, on your picture. Uh, then at uh, eight and nine tenths seconds before the actual liftoff, ignition takes place. That's when those five F1 engines begin belching forth their million and a half pounds of thrust each. There they are for a total of seven and a half million pounds of thrust with their uh, great fuel load uh, uh, there uh, with the great explosive potential if not controlled exactly through those nozzles. And, and nearly nine seconds after the uh, ignition begins, the hold down arms fall back and uh, the rocket with its uh, full power building up is released to begin its slow climb up uh, toward the skies. Uh, just a couple of seconds later it yaws, it rolls a little bit uh, and then with the roll program complete about uh, a half a minute into the flight uh, it's uh, rolled over so it's on its proper azimuth, its launch course at uh, 1 minute and 21 seconds into the flight, you begin to see the contrails, which indicate that it has reached that point in the sky where the maximum dynamic pressure of its uh, launch and its piercing of the atmosphere has come. That aerodynamic load of 460,000 pounds on the fragile skin of the spacecraft, and it is one of the dangerous points of the launch. It's a maximum buffeting that the pilots get as they uh, take off. At that point, the vehicle's 8 miles high, and and three miles downrange, and it's moving at about 1,800 miles an hour. At uh, two minutes and 15 seconds, the inboard engines of that first stage begin to cut off, uh, and then uh, uh, just uh, oh, uh, 30 seconds later, the outboard engines cut off. Uh, by that time, the vehicle's 41 miles high, 57 miles downrange, running 6,000 miles an hour. Then the first stage separates at two minutes and 41 seconds. Uh, the S2 second stage ignites, uh, it uh, completes its job and is jettisoned at 3 minutes and 11 seconds. Then the launch escape system jettisons 6 seconds after that. Uh, at uh, 7 minutes and 39 seconds, the inboard engine cuts off on the second stage. Uh, the, the, the interstage has been jettisoned earlier, I should say. The second stage cuts off at 7.39, the outboard engine's at 9.11, and the separation of the second stage at 9 minutes and 12 seconds. Uh, then we get the third stage ignition, and uh, at 11 minutes and 50 seconds, orbital insertion. The flight is on its way and at least has reached Earth orbit 115 miles high. It's two, uh, it's uh, uh, about two and a half hours later, one and a half revolutions later, that then the S-4B uh, third stage fires up again to uh, move from the 17,500 mile an hour to the 24,000 miles an hour escape velocity to go into a translunar trajectory on the way to the moon at last. CBS News color coverage of the launch day of Apollo 11 will continue in a moment. And it's just five minutes uh, to the historic launch of the Apollo 11 with all going well. Astronauts Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin sitting there atop the uh, great Saturn rocket in their command module getting ready for launch. Here's Jack King and launch control. Counting. Skip Chauvin informing the astronauts that the swing arm are now coming back. The astronauts will have a few more reports coming up in the countdown. The last business report will be from Neil Armstrong at the 45 second mark in the count when he gives the status on the final alignment of the stabilization and control system. We're now passing the four minute 30 second mark in the countdown, still go at this time. Four minutes, 15 seconds, the test supervisor now is informed launch vehicle test conductor Norm Carlson, you are go, go for launch. From this time down, uh, Carlson uh, handles the countdown as the launch vehicle uh, begins to build up. We're now hitting the four minute mark. Four, minute mar four minutes and counting, we are go for Apollo 11. We'll go on an automatic sequence uh, starting at three minutes and seven seconds. The, astronaut, the uh, engines that uh, 
generate that thrust uh, uh, combined horsepower equal to 543 jet fighter planes. Their launch uh, vehicle there weighs as much as the submarine Nautilus. They burn 5,662,000 pounds of fuel, the equivalent of 98 railroad tank cars of it, the capacity of a small town's water tank. Lift off, the noise reaches 120 decibels and has been compared to 8 million hi fi sets playing at once. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. Firing command coming in now. We are on the automatic sequence. We're approaching the three minute mark in the count. T minus three minutes and counting. T minus three. We are go with all elements of the mission at this time. We're on an automatic sequence as the master computer supervises hundreds of events occurring over these last few minutes. T minus two minutes, 45 seconds and counting. The members of the launch team here in the control center monitoring a number of what we call red line values. These are tolerances we don't want to go above and below in temperatures and pressures. They're standing by to call out any deviations from our plans.